Good evening. Welcome to Bible study tonight, Crossroads Baptist Church. I'm Greg, and um, tonight I'm going to be giving, kicking off a, a new series. So whenever you see me up here after this, I'm going to be talking about the first few chapters of Genesis. I figure the best place to start is at the beginning, and this is what Genesis is. As a matter of fact, the Oxford Dictionary defines the word Genesis as the origin or mode of formation of something. And the first 11 chapters of Genesis literally set up everything that our existence is. Genesis tells us of the beginning of man, woman, marriage, the home, sin, sacrifice, and many other things that we know as a culture and through our faith. As a matter of fact, our faith hinges on what we believe about Genesis. And tonight we're going to begin in the beginning with Genesis 1, the creation week. And this is really fascinating as you get into it. And the more you get into it, the more fascinating it is. And I know that this is a bold claim. You might want to scoff at it. But the fact of the matter is, that the point is not for you to believe me. The point is for you to believe God. And the Bible is quite literally his authoritative account of his own story and how it relates to us. In Genesis, we find the account of how everything began, told from the perspective of the person who was there. God himself. Even if you don't believe in God or that the Bible is the Word of God, then what you are about to hear may seem like nothing more than a bedtime story, but a very fascinating bedtime story. Take a moment and consider this. Everything that you see, all that you taste, touch, and feel around you, Go ahead and close your eyes if you have to. Now, can you fathom none of this existing, even you? There was only God. Now, let's begin, and we're going to start as I read Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the deep of and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb, yielding seed, and the fruit tree, yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb, yielding seed after his kind, and the tree, yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself, after his kind. And God saw that it was good. 
and the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great wells and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female, created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living creature that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing fruit which is upon the earth, which is upon the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of, of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all the work which God had created and made. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the information that you give us and for what you share with us through your holy word and through your divine inspiration. We thank you for the insight that you've given us on the creation of everything that we see and experience around us. Lord, as we give the message tonight, we ask that you would, um, first of all, be glorified um, through the message and open our hearts, minds, and ears to receive what you would have us to receive from this message. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Okay, that was the reading of Genesis chapter 1 and, po and portions of chapter 2 to fulfill the creation week. Now we're going to go back through and look at several of the verses and several of the things that were said in depth. When we consider, I want you to consider for a minute pr prior to Genesis 1. Before this, nothing existed. And I mean even more nothing than uh, there's nothing in the refrigerator or I'm stuck in the middle of nowhere. There was nowhere. There was no nothing as we know it. There was only God. Day one. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now I want to note that this is only the beginning of our history, the history of man and everything we know. All three personages of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they already existed and they existed eternally. And when we get to the New Testament, um, the Gospel of John tells us so much. In the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was already there. Jesus was already there at this point. And they were setting things in motion. God doesn't spend any time trying to defend His existence or where He came from. He just starts off by telling us what He did and how He set things up. So we move on to verse 2, and the earth was without void, was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And already, two verses into the Bible, we come across one of the first attempted compromises of Scripture, and this is commonly called the gap theory. The gap theory was invented by Thomas Chalmers in 1814, which is about 45 years before the writing of The Origin of the Species by um, Charles Darwin. And both, uh, both theories, the gap theory and the theory of evolution, kind of gained momentum as Christians at the time tried to accommodate Darwin's theory of evolution and the millions and billions of years with the scripture. The gap, te gap theory teaches something catastrophic happened between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. What it tries to put forth is that this is the time of Satan's fall. This is the time when Satan was expelled from heaven. But um, actually, Scripture itself refutes this theory, as Isaiah 14 tells us of Lucifer's fall. In verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which thou didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne upon the stars of, above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregations in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Lucifer wants to ascend into heaven and exalt his throne above the stars. Problem is, at this point in the creation narrative, stars had not been created yet. They would be created later in the week. Then another verse that refutes this gap theory is Revelation 21.1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. The first heaven and the first earth. Now. If all of this were true about the gap theory, that would make us be in the second heaven 
and the second earth. And the Bible clearly tells us that God created the heaven and the earth in Genesis 1, and that is the same earth that we live on today. If the earth had been destroyed previously, John wouldn't have referred to it as the first heaven and the first earth. Third thing you have to take into consideration that refutes this gap theory is the problem of sin itself. Um, as we get later into these lessons, we find out in chapter 3 that um, sin and death came into the world as a result of Adam sinning. Therefore, if we try to insert the millions and billions of years into somewhere between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, we run into the problem of all the dead dinosaurs and all the other dead evolutionary creatures that somehow would have had to have died before God actually, or before Adam actually brought sin into the world. You have to take all that into account. The gap theory fits the millions and billions of years of evolution, the ice age, and many deaths between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Most likely, and what I succumb to is the, um, the, the verse 2 is all part of the creation process. I mean, we see thing, many things born of water today. As a matter of fact, um, every human being other than Adam and Eve have um, been in the amniotic sac during a woman's pregnancy as they were being fearfully and wonderfully made as the, as the scriptures put it. So Genesis 1-2 goes along perfectly with Genesis 1-1 with no gap. And God said, moving on to verse, um, the rest of uh, the first day, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Day two. And now this is interesting, and I'll tell you a little more about it when we get to day four. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And we'll talk more about the firmament when we talk about Noah. And God called the firmament heaven, and, and the evening and the morning were the second day. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together under one place, and let the land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth the grass, and the herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for day and years, and let them be for lights in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. 
and God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser night to rule the night. He made the stars also. And God said, let set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the light and over the night and divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Now, in day two, I told you when we got to day four, I had something really interesting to share. And think about this. The earth's water is older than the sun. So, in, um, Carnegie, in 2014 issue of Science Magazine produced by Car Carnegie Institute, they discovered somehow that the earth's water is actually older than the sun. Didn't really surprise me that the earth's water is older than the sun. It kind of surprised me that they come to that conclusion and that conclusion once again confirms the creation week because water was created on the second day and the sun was created on the fourth day. So we move on to day five. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the firmament of heaven. And God created great wells and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters and the seas, and let fowl multiply in the earth. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Pay close attention to this word kind that is used, as it's going to be crucial up through chapter 9 of Genesis. We're told that vegeta uh, vegetation produced of its kind, and the animals, whether they're the swimming kind, the great land animals or the fowl of the air all produced offspring of their kind. And that's something else we'll cover more in our account of Noah. And God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after his kind, and cattle after their kind, and everything that creepeth upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Just, I'm going to touch on the kind a little, just a little, while we're here. Kind, at this point, refers to one example would be, we'll use dogs as the example. Let's say a chihuahua, for instance, may not have been a part of the original creation. But whatever the dog was that God created at the time, that dog's DNA contained the blueprint and the directions that would eventually make a chihuahua. A cactus may not have been placed on earth the first week, but again, the blueprints that were in the seeds of some of the other plants had the information and the material to make a cactus. And science, real science that is, points that all creatures have a common ancestor. Continuing with chapter 6, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing 
that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living creature that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of, of a tree yielding seed, to you it shall be for meat. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life. I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw that it was that everything he had made and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Day seven, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. There's a few other takeaways that we can gather from um, just this first chapter of Genesis and things that are important to know. First thing being that um, God is outside of our timeline. So God doesn't see a past and a present and a future the way we do. God's always in the present. As a matter of fact, I remember growing up during my Sunday school days and stuff, I would ask a question that really a lot of people tried to shy away from. That question was, who made God? Well, God was always there. He's the great I am. And you could say even God always is. He's always present. Nothing takes him by surprise. Nothing um, makes him look back. He just keeps in the present. The seven day week was established at this time. The seventh day, which to us is Saturday, was established as a day of rest. And God wasn't tired. He was done. He created a day of rest for our benefit. Saturday was the Sabbath. After the resurrection, Christian believers started worshiping on Sunday, the first day of the week. And for us Christians, a lot of us, it gives us the bonus of having two days during the week. We have the Saturday and we have the Sunday for rest and for worship and for whatever we need to get done. Think about this too. Creation was created in an aged state. You notice when God created creatures and vegetation, he created full grown things. Birds were already flying in the air fish were already swimming in the water, plants and trees were fully grown. He didn't just have a bunch of seeds and eggs laying around waiting for them to ferment and waiting for the gestation period and, and the maturity period until they hatched and grew up into adults. God created adults. And this is important because when people start talking about the millions and billions of years and say that they've age dated this stuff all that means is that's how old God created it to look Adam was the biggest one year old around the other thing that's really fascinating to think about is the detail and the order 
that God followed and created as he um, created the earth and the things that we see. He spent the first three days creating environment, including plants. He created the environment that would sustain his creatures. And then days four through six, he populated the environment in the same order that he created it. Day one goes heaven, earth, and light created, all out of nothing. When, then not until day four, so we haven't talked, on day four, he created the sun, the moon, the stars, and actually this is when he put the timeline in place. God's not restricted to our timeline again. He created it for us so we can tell when we need to go to bed, when we need to get up in the morning, when it's time to go to work and all that, when we're supposed to be in church. Day two, he created the sea and the heaven. That goes along with day five where he created the fowl of the air to fill the sky that he created and the fish of the sea to swim around in the water that he created on day two. Day three, if you recall, and if you look back in Genesis, this is when he brought the land and the vegetation up out of the water. Then he waited three days to day six to fill it with land creatures, with the beasts of burden, and finally with the, us, the creature that he created after his own image. We were the crown and still are the crown of God's creation. Day seven, he, as I stated earlier, he rested. He did this as an example for us. We weren't ever meant to work like machines. We weren't ever meant to keep going and going and going and going. We were meant to stop. We were supposed to stop on the seventh day and worship him. God wasn't tired when he did this. He was done. So you know what else that means. That means that there are no new creations after this creation week. There's been new discoveries after this week. There's been... Um, the DNA and the mixing of the different kinds to create a new kind, but there have been no new creations since the creation week. And that even includes up to this coronavirus that we have around us right now. That's not new. It's been carried around or dormant for quite a while, but it's not anything new, it's not a new creation, it's a new discovery. Seven days, and these were all literal 24-hour days. There's another theory that I want to touch on real fast. It's called the age-date theory. And this is another effort that um, some well-meaning Christians will try to do to make the Bible align with Darwin and his millions and billions of years. And they'll say that each day is an indeterminate amount of time. And they even have a verse they like to use. They use 2 Peter 3.8, with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. That's what they use to try to back up their claim. And they also point to the Hebrew word for day, yom. Yom is the Hebrew word used for day in the Hebrew translation of um, the Torah. 
Notice say that yom has different meanings, that it can also mean a period of light, a general term for time, a point of time, sunset to sunset, sunset to sunrise, a year, a time period of unspecified length, long but finite span of time. But the problem is, if you look at our word day, the modern English word day, we have that same problem. Some people, as they're talking, they'll say back in my grandfather's day or the other day or day has different meanings in our own language. As we look at the word yom and we look at the Hebrew usage, of the word, just like the gap theory that I talked about at the beginning of my message, this theory falls flat when it's held up to scripture and what it says. And we don't even have to go very far in the Bible for that. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And the evening and the morning were the third day and the evening and the morning were the fourth day, and the evening and the morning were the fifth day, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. One last thing I want you to think about. It took the first recorded population was done and it took um, from the year 1, 1 AD, to the year 1804, the recorded population went from 0.2 billion people to finally a billion in 1804. That population reached 2 billion in 1927, 3 billion by 1960, 4 billion by 1974, 5 billion by 1987, 6 billion from 1999, and in 2011 it reached 7 billion. So in 2010 years, the world population grew by 7 billion people. According to secular scientists, modern humans have been around for more than 200,000 years. If this was true, the world population would be a lot bigger than what it is now. Seven billion people in 2010 years. Now multiply that by 100 we should have close to 700 billion people alive right now if, if this 200,000 year theory was true. The only thing that's true in all this is God's Word. God created the earth. He created everything around us. He created it in and seven, six literal days and rested on the seventh day. We as humans are God's most prized creation. And that is why he, some 4,000 years after creation, sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sin. God's word is true, Genesis is true, Jesus, Jesus even believed the Genesis account. He was there. As we close tonight, if there's anybody watching who um, has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to look at God's magnificent creation. Look at what's around you, the, the clouds, the trees, 
Look at the people that are around you. There's a lot of beauty, and it would be just silly to think that this stuff got here randomly. We want to go downtown and look at um, the nationwide building. We want to look at the Clippers Stadium. We want to look at the Crew Stadium. We want to look at any of the magnificent structures that are downtown, or even our own house, and say, oh, that happened by random circumstance. It had a creator. God. God created the heavens. He created the earth just as he said he did. He created everything that you see and a lot of things that you can't see. The things that you can't see affect your life as much as the things that you can see. I don't know where you are or might not know who you are, but I'm very confident to tell you that every single person here on earth needs to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. And if you have questions about that, I would urge you to contact Crossroads Baptist Church, and someone would be happy to walk you through the um, road to salvation. Someone would be happy to um, meet with you. Somebody would be happy to talk with you. But I'm going to close this in prayer. Lord, I thank you tonight for the chance to do this, for the chance to talk to people, for the chance to share your magnificent creation and how you went about the process of doing this. More importantly, the plan that you had in place the whole time to send Jesus to redeem this creation of yours. Lord, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for being a merciful and loving God. We thank you that even if it was just one of us, you would have still um, sent Jesus to die on the cross. Lord, I lift up the people watching the um, you would put a hedge of protection around them. I lift up uh, the members of our church family, the members of our own biological family, that you keep them safe during this time of um, COVID-19. Lord, I lift up the leadership of this church, that you would continue to guide them in the, in the decisions that they make. and. I pray for those that are in the congregation that are feeling lonely and isolated at this time. Um, just reassure them that they have, most importantly, that you're there. You're always there with them. And then, Lord, I just thank you for your word and for the Holy Spirit that guides us. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.